Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. Tonight we're going to look at my new acquisition for the Vintage Computer Collection. It's a Texas Instruments TI-994A. Similar or similar in capabilities, I guess, to an Atari 800 series or a uh, Commodore 64. I'm saying that lightly because it wasn't nearly as good as the other two I mentioned. It came out in June of 1981 at an introductory price of $525 US and uh, it was discontinued in March of 1984. Now I've seen quite a few of these around so they must have sold a reasonably good amount of them but uh, I guess it didn't perform up to Texas Instruments expectations and thus it was unceremoniously dropped. If I remember this correctly, at the very end they were blowing these out for $99. I mean you got the computer, you got a manual, you got a uh, power supply and a uh, combination modulator switch box. So all you needed was a TV and it's got built-in BASIC so you could just turn it on and start programming away in BASIC. An interesting side note I'd like to mention first is that this is run by Texas Instruments owned TMS 9900 uh, processor which was a 16-bit processor at 16K of RAM and rumor has it that Texas Instruments tried really hard to convince IBM to use their processor in the not as yet uh, released IBM PC and uh, supposedly they were negotiating but uh, I guess it didn't work out. I can't seem to find anything else that used the TI processor but uh, it would be a different computing world today if IBM had succumbed and purchase this processor. But that's just my opinion. Alright, so let's see what it looks like. So the first thing I did was again I, I hooked it up in a rather noisy fashion with alligator clips from the antenna terminal connector on the modulator to the antenna input on the TV to just see uh, what it does. Why doesn't my TV want to work? Because the power connector had slid out. So let's see, the TV's in uh, regular TV mode and uh, we are on channel 3, which the modulator is set to. So here we go. Let's come up. Has an extremely noisy picture. I mean, it actually, looking at my monitor, it, <laughs> the uh, camera makes it look a little bit better than uh, what it looks like in real life. I can't. I don't, it's pretty much unusable the way it looks. Now I've used, you know, haven't used a really good way to hook it up. I'm sure that if I used a cleaner way and uh, I would decrease the uh, interference somewhat, but uh, but this is what it is. So uh, the next thing, uh, or the first thing that I really thought of doing was we need a composite video output on here so we get a good picture. So what I did was I went through and uh, looked online to see, you know, the, pretty much uh, mods for all these computers are usually available online of where to connect wires to to get it out. And then finally after doing some more reading, I couldn't really find anything that would tell me exactly how to do this. So after looking at the schematics, I finally figured out that uh, the way this works is, you know, the modulator is hooked up via this 5-pin DIN cable. 
but I guess, you know, I was used to the modulators usually being inside the computer, having internal connections, and then just having a switch box outside. But this, since this is a combo, there is actually composite video and sound on this 5-pin connector. So uh, all I really needed was a cable. Make a cable that basically takes the video and audio signals and terminates with RCA plugs. So you get the uh, so you get a nice looking picture. So that's what I built. If I can find the end of it. But it doesn't want to cooperate. There's your power cable. Right. Here it is. So when we plug in our uh, composite cable, and I'll show you a diagram in a minute what that looks like if you want to build your own. But uh, turn on the TV and we switch back to the AV input. And now we get a pretty good picture out of it. And yeah, it looks pretty much looks as good as it does on the camera. And you get a menu, it scans to see if there's any cartridges in here. But uh, with nothing in there, it just sees the TI Basic. And uh, you go into TI Basic. And there you have it. So, uh, what does a game look like? I mean, we'll do more on games later, but just to give you an idea. Uh, Let's do Centipede. And Centipede was actually kind of interesting because it was one of the few third-party cartridges. This was made by Atari for them. Uh, TI supposedly didn't encourage third-party developers very much. And, you know, these their cartridges all looked like this. This one was owned by MT, or MJ. I didn't get any cartridges with it, but over the years I've collected some of them. And, uh, you know, anticipating this day, and the day is here now. So, you know, Adventure kind of looks like an Atari 2600 game, but let's put in Centipede to give you an idea of what these things look like. And again, you power it on. It detects the cartridge and gives you a choice of what to run. And uh, there you go. There's Centipede. One of the things that may be bleeding through on the sound is this annoying buzz. And the annoying buzz is coming from the transformer here. I mean, even when the machine isn't turned on, just plugging this into AC makes it buzz. So something's loose inside or lost a few windings. Anyway, sorry about that, but that's the way it is. And so there's Centipede. It says press fire button uh, to start, and that brings us to the first or well, the first thing that really needs to be done for this is uh, we need a joystick to be able to play games. Of course I went out. I have quite a few Atari style joysticks that look like this. And it has, you know, a proper a DB9 input on the side. I plugged it in and nothing happened. So again, I did some reading and it turns out that TI has their own joysticks, which aren't nearly as nice as the Atari ones. But worse than that is they changed the pinout on them. So there's no I mean, electronically they're compatible because they just got a bunch of normally open switches in there. But uh, the wires are different. So I had to come up with a solution to make some sort of a crossover cable. And then it should work. All it really needs is to route the correct wire to the correct input. 
it's kind of it's easy it's kind of like playing the piano all you got to do is hit the right key at the right time so uh, that was the first thing to do because I can start a game but uh, on this game I'm sure there are key equivalents for all the joystick uh, directions and buttons and stuff like that but uh, I for one am not very good at playing a game that is made to use a joystick on a keyboard it's one of the things I hated about the Apple II because a lot of the games did not assume that he had a joystick and yet you find your way on the keyboard to do that so one of the first things we need to do is to build us a gizmo that basically reroutes that is a multi crossover cable so that we can just plug one of these guys in and play the play wonderful games like the ones you're seeing on the screen right now but first a quick look at how I made the AV cable what you're going to need is a male DIN 5 plug and this is a view with the pins pointing towards you so pin one on it is and notice the uneven numbering I mean they're not sequential they jump all over the place something you have to get used to when uh, you're making MIDI cables same here usually the uh, plugs are numbered somewhere if you look closely it's usually embedded in the plastic if not, uh, look it up online. There are several references for uh, DIN 5 pinouts. But anyway, pin 1 is the audio, pin 4 is the composite video, and pin 2 is the common ground. So what you do is you hook up pin 1 to the tip of an RCA plug, which is, goes to the audio input on your display device, pin 4 to the tip of a second RCA plug, and uh, that goes to the video input and ground is common so you connect ground to both of the RCA's uh, uh, rings and uh, there's your cable you can also buy them online but uh, this is so much more fun making your own oh and I forgot to tell you at the very beginning that uh, I'm finally trying out a new camera with this episode that after looking around for a long time I found something that I think may work and you're looking at it right here and I have a tricky mirror set up to basically take a picture of itself through several mirrors but uh, this is what it looks like and uh, hopefully we're getting a better picture quality than before on with the subject matter so here's the approach I took for the crossover cable it looks cool doesn't it you take a DB25 cable such as this and uh, you cut it at a desired length then you ohm out the whole thing and I will show you a diagram of what pin goes to which and uh, you end up with the male side that the uh, Atari joystick plugs into and the female side that plugs into the side of the TI and uh, simple enough I mean the pain in the butt is you know ohming it all out and knowing which pin is which wire color on the uh, the internal wire color on the con uh, on the cable that connects the DB20 DB9s and uh, but let's see let's give it a try and see if I was successful with this and uh, now nah, centipede's good but let's get everything into the frame here and uh, here's the Atari stick so the Atari stick uh, goes into the male side, like so, and the female side goes inside of the computer. So let's see if I messed up or if I connected it all right. 
because again as I mentioned before the interior is the same thing it's basically five normally open switches four directions and a fire button and that's the exact thing that the TI looks for except of course that the wires are routed differently so Press fire button. Pre press enter to start. All right. Left, right. Up, down. It's working. I know it wasn't that complicated, but there's a lot of potential to mess up here when you're oming out the whole thing and connect, connecting things wrong. But hey, this is just like playing the arcade. Not. Okay, so uh, the joystick thing works. I should probably go ahead and make uh, permanent solder connections between everything and uh, We'll show you the result and find out if it still works. So here we have a connection diagram. These are the pin numbers on the Atari joystick. And these are the pin numbers on the TI joystick input. So this is the crossover scheme you have to use. On the Atari side, these the pins are right ground, left, down, fire, and up. And the only difference here is, as some of you may be wondering, uh, what if I want to add a second joystick? And that is possible, except that the TI only has one joystick input. And the way they overcome that, I mean on the Atari and the Commodores, they had two joystick input plugs that were working so there was no select necessary, they were just ground was ground all the time. What they did on the TI, the ground line doubles as a select line. It's normally high and only goes low when the computer wanna read, in this case, joystick number one. And then there's another line. So you would do an identical connection. You could connect a second joystick in parallel, except you would have to take Pin 8 would have to be connected to, not pin 7 on the TI side, but rather, let me see if I can find that here, to pin 2. So let me put that on there. So basically, you can wire a second joystick in there with all the same connections except that pin 8 of the second joystick needs to be connected to pin 2 on the uh, TI side and in that case you can have joysticks, two joysticks. Of course you have to have a Y cable, a YDB9 so you have two inputs on the one side and it becomes more complicated mechanically and that's why I didn't do it. I don't foresee needing a second joystick, but if you so desire you can do that. And you can also go on to eBay because uh, I've seen there's basically a little board that plugs into the side of the TI and that has two joystick inputs on it and that basically has all of this work already done for you. So what does it all look like after I spent a good 45 minutes soldering this thing. So in the end, there is your connection. Everything's connected together and the one lesson I need to learn every time I solder something, insert the shrink wrap before you solder the wires together. I'll leave it at that. And then of course you solder all the wires together and you need one big piece to go over it all. And once you have all the wires soldered, you realize that you forgot to slip a big piece over here to cover this whole thing. Uh, I'm not saying that's what I did, but that is the whole idea here, of course, that we do a final... Well, let's see if we can even get all of this wire mess in there. 
without ripping anything out. And uh, yeah, we're almost there. But that's the idea. So then we apply some heat over here. And there is our joystick adapter cable. And now we can play another game. And so here's the real reason I built that uh, joystick adapter. I, uh, the next game I just couldn't play with the keyboard. Sure, I could have gone to eBay and, uh, you know, bought, bought an adapter or actually bought original TI joysticks, but there's some on eBay that are like $25 plus shipping. And that would be, I paid less than $25 for this, for this computer, so that wouldn't make any sense. And anyway, you know, what would I show in the video? Taking money out of my wallet or PayPal? Anyway, so let's see how the joystick performs. What do we have? Adventure. No, that's not what I wanted to play. That is not the reason. Well, let's look at it anyway. Where is the database? I don't know. Oh, that's interesting. It's a cartridge, but it's looking for the database either on cassette or disk drive. Oh, well. So the little prism things you're seeing on here. It's a camera artifact. We got a solid green background in real life. So never mind the adventure game. I think that's that's actually that's a Scott Adams adventure. That's a text adventure. So Burger Time. Press any key to begin. That doesn't show up too well, does it? Ah, you can see a little bit better there. Oh, no. All right, come here, you lovelies. Come here, follow me. Oh, come on. So much more fun with a joystick. Oh, no, no. Come on, follow me. Chicken. Come on, I gotta make at least one hamburger. Okay, just the top of the bun. All right. You get the idea, right? So the joystick adapter works, and that was plenty of fun. And I have a few more cartridges we can look at, but let's do something a little bit more productive and take a peek under the hood.
and see what's making it run. So after tearing through the case and the inevitable RF shield, such as this one, but it's actually the internal build quality is pretty good on this. I mean on the Ataris and the Commodores you have these RF shields that are soldered to the PC board and you need a 100 watt soldering gun to get them off. For here everything was screwed in and uh, once you paid attention it came apart relatively easily. So here's the board, here's the uh, power regulator and everything else is contained on this board, the uh, centerpiece being the TMS9900, which was the uh, microprocessor. It's a 64-pin uh, package, has a full 16-bit data bus on it, but that's about where the excitement stops, because the way this was built, it was kind of lame. It only had three internal registers, I think the program counter, the uh, stack pointer, and a pointer to the working register set, but uh, there weren't any, there wasn't any RAM or anything. Though that that register set that it used wasn't on this chip, but rather had to be supplied externally. And the way it works is they have two MCM sixty eight tens which are 128 byte, uh, 128 byte uh, static RAMs. We have two of them, because this is a 16-bit, has an external 16-bit data bus. And that's basically, they're mapped to a very specific place in the address space, and that's where the processor maps the working registers, the 16-bit registers to basically has to do an external fetch to get the register. So that in itself, and it running at 3 megahertz, <clears throat> seems kind of lame compared to the competition, which basically was the Intel 8086 or the Motorola 68000. So uh, back to this, uh, there are also two ROMs in here. Again, there's two ROMs because it is using 16 bits so it's not for extra space but rather to provide the full 16 bits a lot of nickel and dime parts an interesting thing is that pretty much everything is soldered in but there's some TTL chips let's see what are these no these are actually PALs over here the PALs are the only thing no that's not true let me have a closer look at this and see what these things are. Yes, they're PALs or small PROMs or whatever, but they're the only thing that is uh, socketed here. Everything else they had a high bit of confidence in. Well, the video processor is also socketed. <clears throat> But yeah, other than that, we have a whole lot of uh, TTL parts for glue logic. We then have the uh, TMS9901 programmable system interface, which uh, gives you I.O. ports, timers used for interrupts or otherwise. I also, this is not something I've seen used. I'm sure there's something, there's one or two systems that use this, but I can't think of any. I can't think of anything that used this processor either other than this. And so far so good. Yeah, we're a little weak on RAM, but we can already see there's more RAM here. There's actually nine bits of 16K dynamic RAM over here. But here's where things start going downhill a little bit. What we have over here is the vi video display processor, a 9918, which is a self-contained display chip. And the external memory over here is tied directly 
to the data bus, to the secondary data bus that this the video display processor drives. So you dump things into here from the processor through this interface. You put your screen data here and then this independently scans screen memory and creates your screen display. So far, so good. But now here's a problem. This system is advertised of having 16K and the 16K it advertises are right here and they're connected to the video display processor. So if this guy needs to use any video memory, he's got to go through here. This has got an 8-bit data bus on it. So main memory is not directly accessible by the processor, but rather it has to query this chip to do the reads. Oh, this also handles the dynamic memory refresh. And uh, to get data out of here. So that significantly slows it down and that's why the performance of this computer was never anything to write home about. And as I said before, this was one of the contenders for the original IBM PC along with the Motorola 68000 Intel One Out. I'm not so sure whether Intel or Motorola would have been better from a programmer's side of view obviously Intel 1, but this guy, I don't think this would have been a very good choice to go into the IBM PC. Leave me a comment and tell me what you think about that. So yeah, there we have it. it that's pretty much it. There's a cartridge connector here and uh, the whole idea of having to go through this chip to get to RAM. There were RAM expansions available for this too. And I think when you got the RAM expansions, those were actually directly tied through the expansion bus over here, directly to the data bus on the uh, processor. But the base model, which is this, this is what you got. And the timing that this gave you pretty much dictated all of the, all of the software that was written to it, be it third party by TI or third party, which again, uh, TI didn't seem to encourage very loudly for other people to do anything here. The only success, really successful TI part on here is probably the video display processor. This is the 9918. They had a spiffed up version, which was the 9928, which was actually used in the ColecoVision uh, home video uh, console. So uh, they sold a few of those to Coleco. And also in the uh, baby Pac-Man arcade game, the video portion where you played Pac-Man was also driven by one of these things. And that's about it. I mean, anything other than that. This is the uh, joystick interface. And uh, we have, uh, and what this is, is the video output. And there's really not much else to point out here. Nothing else. I'm looking at it real quickly, but yeah, that's it. That these are the innards of the uh, of the TI, and that's what it did. And uh, it probably, I mean, they sold a lot of them, but again, it's considered a failure. And that's probably because of their not encouraging third parties to develop for them, which, you know, right now in, in this day and age is totally academic that you need to have third parties involved to make your platform successful. And second of all, that the hardware was kind of weak. But there you have it. A lot of people got these. And I think the reason there are so many of them around is because they also dropped them to $99. Uh, dollars at their end of life period. And like the guy I bought it from, hey, mom bought me a comu computer, and that was probably the cheapest she could pick up at Sears. All right. That's it for the computer. Let's see if I can put this thing back together again, and then we'll have closing comments. OK. We're all back together now. No parts left over. And uh, turns on. 
audio is a bit noisy. You can hear a bit of digital noise on it, but uh, let's have a look at what else this has to offer. So here is the obligatory Pac-Man clone. I can't tell. Is it? I couldn't tell whether I could still, whether there were still ghosts or not. It's kind of lame. <clears throat> All right, so uh, that's Munchman for you. And I did some research, and supposedly one of the better games on here was Parsec, made by TI. I haven't looked at it yet. I don't know what this is. Oh, it's Defender. Nice explosion. That's not Defender, it's... This is more like scramble. I just wish I could drop bombs or something like that. All right. Okay, even my patience has its limits, so. does work. We were able to uh, interface Atari joysticks to it. So I can't use that as an excuse while I'm not why I'm not having fun with it. We have a pretty good uh, uh, display quality on it, but uh, I'm just not very excited about this. I uh, my first computer was a TRS-80 Model 1, which was of course this thing is uh, obviously better than that or maybe not even because Anyway, as far as games development, the TRS-80 wasn't the knees bees, but uh, I graduated to an Atari 800, and that's where I did a lot of game programming on, and really got into great game programming because there were so many things you could do with it, which you can't really do with this. Now, I know I have been uh, less than enthusiastic about this machine, and I know that there's some of you out there who earned their spurs with this machine, and probably disagree with my dour uh, description of this. So uh, either way, make yourself be heard with a comment down there. And uh, I don't know, I'd love to hear things that uh, I don't know about this because quite frankly, this is the first time I have one sitting on my desk. Even back in the Stone Ages, I never had access to one of these and neither did I have a desire to do so. So my... Uh, opinion of this may be slightly colored. So let me know what you think. I hope you like this and I hope it's worth a thumbs up for you. And as before, comments, 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 and make sure to subscribe. 
Hopefully next time I'll find a more exciting games machine. See ya.